It's good to meet people from one Sabbath to another, isn't it? It's good to come into the house of the Lord together. So, let's see. We're going to go to God's Word in just a moment. But if I can have all of the men in church just stand. All of the men. If you're a man, please stand up and be counted among us. Thanks for gathering and worshiping with us. And I'd ask you to remain standing as we pray just now. Father, as we come into your house to worship you, uh, we've done so with humble hearts. And Lord, as I've asked each of the men in our church to stand, I ask that you will give them a, a special blessing as we go to your word today. That as we lean upon you, as we open our hearts and our lives to you, that you will fill us with your spirit, that we might resemble uh, your character, Father, to our families. So bless them in a mighty way today as we worship you, I ask in Christ's precious name, amen. Be seated, please. There are two responsibilities in life that are becoming more and more complex. That of motherhood and that of being a father. I am slightly persuaded by just the weight of a hair that motherhood is more complex than fatherhood. Simply because mothers are with children far more hours in a day than a father typically is. Would you agree, gentlemen? However, that being said, I believe that being a father today is far more complex than any time in Earth's history. I read some interesting statistics just to set the stage in context today. 50% of American youth will live without their fathers at some time before they turn 18. That means half of the children growing up today will grow up at some time living in a family without their biological father. 80% of the adolescents in psychiatric hospitals come from fatherless homes. 90% of the homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 80% of those who have displaced anger issues and are motivated to be rapists come from fatherless homes. 72% of the adolescent murderers grew up without a father. 63% of youth su suicides come from fatherless homes. The importance of a father in the home cannot be understated or underestimated. Do you believe that, friends? So we're all we are going to focus on the importance of fathers and their spiritual leadership in the home today. You may be part of the 20% of those who live in a home who are single or who are married without children. Listen to the principles involved and apply them to your life because I believe that living as a Christian today is more complex than it's ever been in earth's history. And we need a full imbuing of the Lord's Spirit and a full leading of Christ's life in our life and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we might glorify Him. I'd like to suggest to you today that the first characteristic, if we are going to be faithful to Christ, is to manifest His love 
in our homes in a greater in greater way every day. There is nothing more important if you are a man or a woman today than living Christ's life out in your character in such a way that each person in your household, be they children or be they a spouse, might see God revealed through your life. It doesn't matter what the boss thinks about you at work. It doesn't matter how you come across to friends outside of your family. If you lose the influence in your home, you've lost the most important thing on earth. Can you say amen? There is nothing more difficult than raising children for God today. Nothing more difficult that we need the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of God day by day to make manifest in a tangible way His love to our children. Nothing more important. When you draw your last breath, when you realize that your time has come, you will not be counting and looking at the size of your bank account, the number of cars in your driveway, the size of the house you live in, or the accolades of your friends on your earthly accomplishments. You will be wondering where your children are and their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I speaking the truth today? It's awful quiet out there. Am I speaking the truth today? So listen carefully. This is, not about, this is not about talking to somebody else. It's about you and I and God having a conversation of importance and priorities today. For you see in Matthew in Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 12, God makes it abundantly clear how he, how he deals with his revelation to a perishing world. He talks about his love by drawing a parallel of a love that a man has for his children being that of illustrative of his great love for each one of us. In verse 9 of Matthew chapter 7, Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a snake? Will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father which is in heaven give that which is good to those who ask him? Verse 12 says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law of the prophets. How is it? that in our earthly desires to bless our children, we will give them those things that they want because we will see for just at least a moment a smile on their face when it's their birthday and you give them that which they desire. When it's Christmas, when it's of no reason, you say, let's go do that activity. And you see that glimpse of joy for just a moment. And dad says, it's worth that sacrifice. Mom says, oh, the joy of motherhood. Love. Love. Fill their lives with the love of their heavenly father. For you see... From ages of one to four, in their formative years, they only know the expressions of love that come through you men. If you're off distance, somewhere else, climbing the corporate ladder, taking care of all of the, all of the earthly things and the press of business that's upon you, and you miss that influence, you have traded that which is eternal for that which is temporary. Never make that trade. Never make that trade. Your children are worth all of that which this world has to offer and some more. Did you see 
on the front of your bulletin the tender hand of the infant placed in the hand of their father, trusting that they might be led by their father. The first thing that as we consider uh, this morning about being a godly father is the godly father has a heart filled with love for Christ first and foremost, and then a heart filled with love for his spouse and his children. And they're not afraid or timid in their expression of that, day by day expressing that love deeply, expressing that love that may, they might know they are cared about tangibly with warm hugs and expressions. The second thing that God calls men today to be is leaders in their home. They are called to lead as Christian leaders in their home by deed and example. For you see, it's not enough just to believe, but we must lead by word and deed. Colossians, jot the reference down, 3.17 says, And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everything we do lead by example, in deed and word. Would you like to, fo uh, would you like to follow a person like that? I would, wouldn't you? The problem is, there is no such thing as a perfect father, is there? Let's get that out of the way real quickly. There's no such thing as a perfect child, is there? Now, moms come real close to that most of the time, but there's no such thing as a perfect mother, is there? But there are mothers and fathers and boys and girls, and fathers are called in a special way, not only to believe, but to proclaim and lead, but also in deed, in word, to make manifest to those who come in contact with them in their lives, that they will see a consistency between that which they believe and that which they live. And they will be able to observe the harmony and the blessings that comes to a man as he leads his family closer to Christ. Not only is there the loving, the leading, there's the leaning aspect of being a godly father. So how does that work? What does that leaning word mean? That means in all of your busyness, in all of the things you're called to do, when your children are around you, that you lean gently into their life. How does that work? There are some fathers, yes, just simply, they are like drill sergeants. They've been in the army, and their family is going to be directed just like an army. I told you to take out the garbage 35 seconds ago, and you're still on your Nintendo. You should have had it done 10 seconds after I asked you to. That'll be 10 push-ups, please, right over here. And the more that that is instituted, the more the kids are going, I'm slipping away from Dad every chance I get. Now I see some real serious looks on some of the kids' faces. It may be your dad I'm talking about. Don't you tell him that yet. The problem is not that we love our kids. The problem is how we express that love. Lording over them and leaning into their lives are two different things things. When you lean into their life ever so gently, it's coming alongside of them and what interests them and say, can you share with me how that works? You know, I'm not sure how this gadget works, and you probably do know. 
Leaning into them is expressing confidence in them. It's like one of my colleagues. We were in a committee meeting, and he was telling me with great joy and some hesitation how he had been up at PUC. And that little son of his, who somehow grew to be a young man and now was almost graduating from college, taking a degree in aviation, had said, Dad, guess what I'm going to give you for Father's Day? And Dad said, what? Next time you come up for a board meeting at PUC, I'm going to fly you home. Mm. He knew what that meant. He knew, he knew what that meant. It, mean that, it meant that he, who did not like to fly, would have to take a deep breath in several times and think and trust in the Lord and lean into his son's life. It was the morning they were to take off. He's telling me this the next day. He said, as we took off, I looked out the plane and I said a silent prayer. But I had full confidence in the Lord and in my son and in his training that we would make it those several hundred miles to Glendale and land safely. And as they flew along the coastline, it looked like they were probably not quite as high as they could be. And as the plane kind of went up and down, for moments there, he was just saying, okay, Lord, I'm trusting in his ability that he learned his lessons well, and I'm trusting in your ability. If he forgot something, you can bring it to his attention. And as he leaned in to, with full confidence and trust in his son, as the plane touched down, there was a certain amount of father-son connection that hadn't been there before. Because now it was the father trusting the son, instead of always it just be the son trusting the father. And it's leaning in to their lives that will develop the relationships for Christ. There's the listening carefully to our sons and daughters. Listening carefully to that which interests them rather than that which interests us. It's amazing if you want to catch somebody's attention. The first thing you should do is start talking, right? Hmm, coming from a preacher, I'm not sure exactly how this all works, because I should be listening for just a few moments to what you're interested in. Because the truth is, if you will listen to people, they indeed will share with you what's on their mind and in their hearts at a particular time. But listening is a bit of an art that is often lost, and sometimes lost by this generation. He was an 80-year-old man as he was sitting on the sofa in his house alongside his 45-year-old his 45-year-old highly intelligent son, highly educated son. The 80-year-old suddenly realized there was a crow perched on their window. The father asked the son, "What is this?" The son replied, "It's a crow, dad." A few minutes later, the father asked the son a second time, What is this on the window? The son said, Father, I have just now told you it's a crow. After a little while, the old father again asked his son a third time, What is this on the window? At this time, some expression of irritation was felt in the son's tone when he said to the father with a rebuff, It's a crow! 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 This time the son shouted at his father, Why do you keep asking me the same question again and again? Although I've told you many times, it's a crow! Are you not able to understand this? A little later, the father went to his room and came back with an old 
tattered diary, which he maintained since his son was born. On the opening page, he asked the son to read his diary. When the son read it, the following words were written in the diary. Today, my little son, age three, was sitting with me on the sofa when a crow was sitting on the window. My son asked me 23 times what it was, and I replied to him all 23 times that it was a crow. I hugged him lovingly each time he asked me the same question again and again for 23 times. I did not feel irritated. I rather felt affection for my innocent child. While the little child asked me 23 times, what is this? The father had felt no irritation in replying to the same question all 23 times. Oh, how it is with the love of a father for his child, and how that manifests God's love to us, that he never tires in listening to us as, he, as we petition him. Listen carefully to the needs and lean in to your children's lives. There is not only the listening that a father must do for his children, there's the looking, looking into your children, knowing where they are, where they are. Not always helicoptering above them. You know helicopter parents? Parents, do you know if you're a helicopter parent? <laughs> Let me ask you, kids, do you, not your parents, do you know of any kids that have helicopter parents? You know, the, the ones that will drive you to school. They won't drop you a half a block away from school. They'll drive you right up to school. They'll wait to count the friends and who you're associating with. And they'll be, they'll know, they'll want to know who's calling, what's going on, what was the essence of the helicopter parents. You know what I'm talking about now? Yeah. They're all around. But listen, listen carefully. And look into their life. Know where they are. Know when they're in danger. And go looking for them if they're missing. It was December 7th, 1988. An earthquake devastated the northwestern section of Armenia, killing an, est an estimated 25,000 in just a few minutes. A father in one small town realized that he must go look for his son at school. He ran the two miles to the school and found the school leveled. The two-story building just leveled. Brokenhearted, he went in search for his son. No heavy equipment to clear the rubble. With his bare hands, he picked up one piece of rubble, a second piece of rubble, a third piece of rubble. After two hours, three hours, four hours, eight hours, through the anguish of not knowing where his son was, he had to carry on until he found his son looking for his son. Twenty-four hours passed. Thirty hours passed. His hands were bruised and bleeding. Thirty-six hours into removing the rubble, he thought he heard a voice coming from a few feet from where he was lifting the debris. Armand, is that you? he shouted. Daddy! Daddy came the voice as the man unburied 
the rubble, he saw the face of his son and eight other people that had a shelter just about the size of a tent. The father's love went looking to find the missing son, always knowing and being concerned about your children, longing to be with them. The additional piece is learn, fathers, to laugh with them. Learn to enjoy, not always be so serious. Learn to enjoy a laugh. The Bible says, a laugh, from, I'm going to paraphrase it, a belly laugh is good for the soul. You know the kind I'm talking about? The kind that you just can't stop. When they do something funny, enjoy the spontaneity of the moment. Connect with your, connect with your kids. So dads, I challenge you to love. Lead. Lean. Listen. Look. Laugh. And love. The last piece I challenge you is just be connected with your kids. In just a moment, we're going to watch a video of One Father's Love. I want to share with you two things, just as we close our time together. On your way out, gentlemen, whether you're a father or a spiritual father or those in our church, at the door you're going to be receiving Strong in the Lord. It's a daily devotional book. We'd like each of you to have a copy of that. I want you to watch a four-minute clip today. It's a story of Dick Hoyt and his son Richard. Richard, as he was a baby, the umbilical cord while he was in the womb cut off oxygen. So he was born with the inability to walk or to speak. Now you won't see the full end of the story, so I'm going to tell you on the 10 or 12 minute version that you won't see, is that Richard eventually, although he could not speak through technology, graduates from college eventually and gets a job and is gainfully employed. But as he was growing, unable to communicate with the world in any tangible way, what he did is he looked at his father, his father would run, and he would indicate that he wanted to go with his father as his father ran. So the father took a stroller at first and took him running with him. And it brought such joy, it brought such joy to the, uh, joy to the son that Rick was his name. He'd just be beaming as the father had never seen him. It led him to take his son and run with his son, not through one marathon or two marathons, but 85 marathons. He would push his son through. Do any of you know what a, an Ironman triathlon is? I forget the number, whether it was three or eight of those that he completed. Those of you that don't know, it's a two and a half mile swim in which he towed his son in a canoe, which he, uh, he bicycled 112 miles with his son on a bicycle built for two, which he pushed him after that the full length of a marathon. And in case you're wondering if he took a stroll through all of this, the two of them finished one Boston Marathon only 35 minutes behind the winner of that marathon. So let me ask you, as you see this, ask yourself, what is it that my son or daughter really enjoys? And how committed am I to them? So listen and be blessed as you watch one father's love for his son. 